Um, I, hi, I'm Rachel. Uh, you guys have probably heard or, or, or seen me around over the last 20 years. Uh, John is shooting this. John, wave. Put oh. your hand in front of the camera. Hi. Uh, don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how this is going to go. Um, I ain't no Scorsese, that's for sure. Yes, you're no... You're no Scorsese. That's that's for sure. I I never make dinner and instruct John as to what it is I'm doing. And I can't have fun banter conversation um, with our in studio audience anymore. So my name is Rachel, and uh, I kind of need help. I have to talk while I cook. So if you're joining me tonight, we're making a uh, chicken pot pie for the weekend. Um, but more than that, we're here to just connect. I don't know when we can be back in my studio, and I mean we, in that I miss my 100 plus family members at, at our show. Uh, we're all on hiatus until late April or so. I, who knows? Um, we hope we'll be back like a phoenix and invite all of our friends back three shows a day. We're not just making chicken pot pie. I'm gonna try and answer your questions, show you some tips about how we're living in um, coronavirus world. Um, and I want this to be a conversation as much as possible, not a cooking class. So if you cook every day, great. If you don't cook a lot, I hope you find this in any way useful. But for real, even if you have never cooked in your life and you are inside now, I don't know how to explain to you what it does for you to learn how to cook something today, any day. Learning how to cook for yourself and people that you care about improves your self-esteem. It gives you focus. It gives you a place of center. It's calming and it's nourishing way beyond the food. It really is magic when you cook. You see everything happen right there. It's just in those few minutes or few hours. Um, and then it's there. It, um, it's kind of magic. So anyway, I'm getting too drippy. So for today, I'm going to catch up in a lot of ways. John, give me some stuff because I'm getting too drippy. Give me something to talk about. You have a long list of questions and oh, things. Oh, I got to go get them. I don't even have them. Okay. Go get the questions. I I'm chopping. Go get them. I'm, okay, wait. Come back. Come back. I'm coming back. So bad. If we do more than one of these, it'll be a miracle, but it, we're already we'll it's so bad. It'll get better and better. It's so bad. Wait, come back. You have to tell them what I'm doing while you're the questions. messing around and not being prepared. Okay, first of all, um, during this time or any time in the world for 20 years, I've been saying, when you bring home all your produce, look down here, John. When you bring home all your produce, whatever day of the week it is, put it away clean, okay? So now we're taking our clean vegetables, and we're just cutting carrot, celery, onion, your basic building blocks, keep them on hand at all times, right? If we can, into like shapes and sizes. It doesn't matter if they're perfect, it doesn't matter how big or small. The most important thing to remember is that everything cooks at the same time, only if it's in the same shape and size. So I'm gonna cut up all this stuff and John's gonna ask a bunch of questions, hopefully. Okay. Why don't you come around and you can watch the chopping of the vegetables while you're asking questions or you just wanna be there? All no, right. I've, got, I've got a question from at. You don't have to say at, honey. At Their name Kalaha. isn't at. Oh what gosh. are some creative egg recipes for one person? Well, uh, any. Anything that you can make with eggs for four people or 400 people or 40 people, you can make for one person. Uh, 
you start with a six inch skillet. And if you want uh, to make a frittata, you saute the vegetables or the protein first. You beat up, the rule is one egg per inch of pan. So the bottom circumference of the pan, if it's four inches, you make four eggs. If it's six inches, you make six eggs, okay? If you're making a frittata, if you're making a baked egg dish. So you're gonna saute whatever you want, little bit of olive oil or butter, add any vegetables or protein you like, and then one egg per inch of pan if you're gonna make baked eggs. You whip that up, you can add a little parm cheese to it if you like, any herbs you like, of course, pour that over the top, put it in a 375 to 400 oven on the middle rack until it's lightly brown and springs back a little bit. Pull it out, let it rest, take it out and cut it up. Now, if you're one person, of course, and you make a six egg frittata, you can eat half of it that day and half of it for snacks later with TV or half of it the next day. You could put some salsa on it or uh, a tomato sauce and melt some cheese. You can make it different the next day. Uh, you can pile it on an English muffin uh, or you can make it the English muffin, the little pieces, you know, you can just make it a, a stack for a piece of ham or a bit of sausage or something. Uh, but basically, you cook in a little pan the same as you would cook in a big pan for one or some. Um, like shapes and sizes, right? So right now we have carrots, celery, leeks, um, and I've got a bag of onions here. A couple of things, put everything away clean. When it comes to leeks, I wanted to just show you one, even though I've already chopped some, for years, decades actually, for literally 20 years, I would have a leek. I always put it away with the end trimmed in a general rinse and cut the very, very ends, tough ends, right? And I would put it away after a quick rinse like this. Then when I would process it, I would cut it however I needed for the recipe. And I would soak it in a giant bowl of ice water, shake it, let the grit fall to the bottom, the little bits of soil that get caught in between the layers, okay? And then I would drain that off, wash the bowl, dry the leeks in a kitchen towel, blah, 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 blah. Jacques Pepin comes to the show. I can't even believe I know him. Almost passed out the day I met him. <clears throat> and I've told this story on the show, so if you watch the show, you already know it. But the day I knew I really loved Jacques Pepin, other than being an idol, was when I walked into his room at 10 o'clock in the morning and he was scratching a dog's belly and drinking red wine the size of a fishbowl out of his left hand. That's my guy. Anyway, um, he was on the show and did this. Cut off the tough ends in kind of a V. Took it to the sink. Ran it under water like a Spanish fan. Gave it a rinse. And then the sexy part. <laughs> Beat it on the kitchen towel. This is my kitchen towel that has stayed here for many years. See what it says? Anyway, Jacques Lefant's way of cleaning leaks is much faster and, and, and better than my former method. <laughs> and that's the fun thing about cooking is that whether people went to Le Cordon Bleu or uh, they learned from their grandmothers or their parents, or in my case, growing up in the restaurant business, everybody's always learning and everybody's always creating their own way of doing things. And it's one of the reasons I love working at Food Network, even after 20 years, AKA Discovery now, hi guys, is that I'm a woman in her 50s who's still considered relevant. And when I started there, I was not um, Emeril or uh, some famous well-known chef. I was a person who grew up working in the restaurant business who was an at-home cook. Oh, look at Izzy. 
Yeah, that's a big deal since she has so who's on the move? a pretty broken back and she's battling several pretty serious ailments. Izzy has FOMO, fear of missing out. Okay, honey. Okay. We need to take an Izzy break, see what she wants. Bye. Okay, so the Izzy Boo break is over. Sorry about that. Um, carrot, uh, celery, leeks, and now we get to the onions. Just like all my vegetables, I trim shallots, red onions, white onions, yellow onions, a couple at a time, because I use so many of them, and I put them away ready to go. Um, and talking about people inventing their own things, I do not cut onions like people that went to proper chef school. I don't put my hand on top and cut into them sideways because an onion is made by the universe or God. Whatever you believe or don't believe in, it comes with layers. So I've never understood wasting the time of cutting into it. I simply cut from the top of the onion down. In this case, it's a fairly big chop, so I don't even have to be that precious about it. And that's it. I mean, it's already peeled and chopped and Oh, look, they're smaller pieces because the onion has a layer. <laughs> so I'm adding some onion to this mix. We're gonna let all this go in some butter and then we're gonna thicken uh, our base with flour. But if you're gluten-free, of course, you can use uh, potato starch. You would use less, about half of what you would use with flour if you're using potato starch. Or you can make this into a soup instead of a chicken pot pie base. We're making chicken pot pie base here, obviously. If you want it a little thinner, you can just make chicken soup. If you want it to be all plant-based, you can use the grilled chicken that comes in 12 ounce packages of plant-based chicken. I, I love the product, I think it's delicious. Just follow along with the vegetable part and when it gets to the poached chicken, throw in the plant-based chicken, fine. And if you want to keep it as soup, just throw in potatoes. And you want to keep it gluten-free, don't add the pastry top. We have the pastry sitting in the outdoor refrigerator, which means outside, because it's still cold enough to get away with it. And we don't have to take up refrigerator drawers. Um, if you're using store-bought pastry to make the tops, we'll get to that in a bit. But if you egg wash them, and if you don't eat eggs, you can substitute buttermilk. If you wash them to get them a little browner and richer in flavor, you have to re-chill them after you brush them. So you defrost for two hours for store-bought puff pastry. Then you cut to whatever shape you like. Then you brush. Then you have to chill for another 30 minutes to set the buttermilk or the egg wash in my case. You let that set. Then you put it into a 400 oven until it's puffy, like really puffed and firm. Take it out too soon. I digress. Anyway, that's another tip. Even prep your onions when you bring them home. Just a couple at a time. I keep most of them in the basket in the corner. And I also, if you eat a lot of eggs and you eat them fresh, I never refrigerate eggs. I keep them like oldie timey like my mom did and my grandpa. If you're gonna eat them within two weeks, I keep them on my counter. If you need them to be longer lead, I keep them in the fridge. But whatever, that's a, the way I was raised. It's a cultural thing. Always my basil is under a little bonnet. And I'm down to just one lemon. That's because I only put three or four into the bowl. They keep longer in the fridge, but I use them so frequently, I keep them right behind me whenever I'm cooking. So I'm down to one, so I'll fill that back up tonight. While I'm putting the vegetables into the pan, you guys should check this out. I did not do this for filming sake. This is legitimately what I've been doing since I've been home. Everything that I cook, I write in notebooks. If you watch me, you know that. But everything since I've been home, I keep track of. If I'm cooking ahead, there's a list of prepared foods. And when I use the food, I, I, I put a full X. If I use half of a product, I put half an X, but every single thing I cook ahead or process in any way and freeze, I keep track of on a main list. Plus I mark the bag that goes in the freezer, but the main list helps. How often do you look in your freezer once you put stuff in there? I know I get lost in that world. So for me, it helps if I keep it on smaller sheets of paper in my kitchen, I can always say, oh, I wanna do this, this, or this. 
So far since we've been home, we've only used two things that were make-aheads. Every day I've been trying to cook fresh as long as I can get good fresh food, but every day I try and bank another meal. Time you make anything that's saucy, make two times that amount so you can put half away for literally another day. We have a five quart uh, skillet. Mine actually, pat on back. Made oval skillets so they could fit on little stoves. My stove used to only be as big as about half this stove and I could never fit two round pots next to each other. That's why I made oval skillets. Anyway, I'm melting double the amount of butter that I would need for chicken pot pie. So I'm melting six tablespoons rather than three and six tablespoons of flour, roughly. I don't measure anything, but about, okay? Marcella Hazan said that measuring for a cook is like putting a bird in a cage, and I firmly believe that. But what I'm doing is double batching. This is two chickens. Now, when you poach chicken, it can be whole chickens, bone and skin on. It can be pieces of chicken, boneless, skinless. It can be pieces of chicken, bone and skin on. Anything you like, you can poach. That just means low rolling boil and add some aromatics to it so it tastes good, that's all. So I made some poached protein, okay? And I made a double batch, so this is two chicken. And this is the byproduct of that. This is all of the flavor of the uh, carrot, celery, onion, leek that I used to poach the chicken. And I fortified the stock, that's why it's this color, with some demi-glass, which you can also use bullion cubes. A lot of people still buy bullion cubes. Kind of the same thing. These keep forever, like literally forever. They have a really long lead date. And you can buy them in tiny little packages, like an ounce and a half. I don't have my glass on. That says an ounce and a half, right, John? Yes. Uh, Butter. So... Oh, the butter. We got to get the stuff in. Move. So it's an ounce and a half. It keeps forever. And I keep uh, those in to fortify the flavor of the stock or the poaching liquid anytime you make stock or poaching liquid, obviously. It's just a little flavor enhancer. But if you have bullion cubes in the cupboard, those kind of do the same trick. So now we put in all of our veg to sweat. Boop. Get into the hot tub, kids. Now, most people do not care for garlic in their chicken pot pie. We are not most people. I'm cooking for my Sicilian mother and my Italian husband. And we all smell like garlic all the time. But this is a good tip on garlic in general. I keep a couple bulbs ahead, already cracked and peeled and in a little container like this. And every time it gets down to the bottom, like I'll have to deal with it tonight before I go to bed, I fill her back up. So I have my own <clears throat> cracked, peeled garlic. Why don't I buy it like that in the grocery store? Because they add citric acid and I don't know where the garlic came from and sometimes it can taste bitter or weird to me. And God forbid, I would never in my life buy garlic paste or chopped garlic. There's nothing to it. All you do is crack the garlic. Here, I'll show you. You take the bulb, you knock it. When you knock it, the cloves fall apart, okay? When the cloves fall apart, you bounce on one and the skin comes off. Then you take off any little bits that look a little squishy and the root, boom, throw it in the box, you're done. Truly not rocket science. <laughs> Do you want another question? Oh, yes. Let's take a lot of questions. I forgot we're supposed to be we're doing to be question and answer. answer. Okay. Q so, and Ray, as they say. This is from n.revis. What can I do with short ribs? It was the only meat available at the grocery store. Short ribs are amazing. 
Uh, short ribs are perfect for braising, and it's still the season of braising. That's typically winter, but we just had eight, eight inches of snow here the other day. But short ribs, you can do a lot with. Brown them. And when we say brown them, here's what I mean. Bring them to room temperature. Pat them completely dry, and I mean bone dry. Season them liberally from above, not to look cool, to season evenly. Season them copiously with salt and pepper. Brown the meat really well all over every single side, including the bone side. And the tendon parts, the itty bits of it will start to pull away, who cares? Then you're gonna add liquid. You can add beer or wine or a little bit of vinegar, you need some acid. Then you're gonna add aromatics, any herbs you like, carrots, celery, onion, stock of any kind, water if you don't have stock, who cares? Cover it, cook it low and slow till it's falling apart, like literally falling apart. When you take it out, separate out the meat, all of that great bone marrow and all of that delicious flavor will have fallen into the broth, just like we did here. Strain your liquids, and then you can go any number of directions. You can make quesadillas, you can make chili, you can make hash and top it with an egg. You can make um, ragu for pastas. It all depends on where you wanna take it after that, but that's the base product. And so the liquid and the meat, you separate the meat and shred it or chop it and put it in that delicious liquid, okay? With the acid and the stock of your choice or water, who cares? All that stuff you put in a bucket, okay? Then you can say, tomorrow I'm gonna make a burrito. So you heat up some black beans and add a little bit of the meat. Then you put a tortilla in the pan, flour, corn, you flip it over, you add some cheese, you put a little meat and black bean on it, fold it in on the ends, roll it up, brown it up, take it out. You want to make ragu. You take that, chop it up. You add a little more onion and garlic to a pan with olive oil and some tomatoes and some basil. Any herbs you want to highlight, put in the chopped meat, toss it with the cooked pasta one minute before cooking time is done on the package direction. Toss it all together with tons of cheese. Oh, so good. You wanna turn it into hash. Chop up, peel and chop up a potato. Put it in a pan with some olive oil and salt and pepper. <clears throat> Maybe uh, sage or paprika or anything you wanna highlight, okay? Season up your potatoes. Put a lid on the potato for a couple minutes. It's gonna brown on one side and sweat on the top. Potato will start to get tender. Then take the lid off. Then add onions and garlic and the meat and keep turning it around and turning it around and turning it around till it all gets brown and crispy. Then the exciting part, drop an egg or two on top, <clears throat> maybe even some cheese. You wanna go nuts, oh. turn it into a Reuben. Add some sauerkraut and Swiss and cover with Russian dressing when you're done, who knows? but you just crisp up that meat, drop an egg on top, cover it, and the steam from the lid will cook the egg on top of all of it. You don't even have to poach the egg or fry the egg. But if you wanna fry an egg, that's a whole separate argument. I would just drop the egg on top, cover it. But you can make it hash that way. I would eat it right out of the pan, personally, or serve it out of the pan. Uh, chili's an easy one. Uh, brown up any kind of spicy sausage, breakfast sausage, chorizo, Mexican, which is fresh, or Spanish, which is cooked, but in the packaged meats case. Chop it up, right? Brown that, add your peppers, onions, sweet peppers and hot peppers, I would do. And then cumin, coriander, chili powder, and your braised short ribs, right? Any tomato product you like. Uh, diced tomatoes, passata, tomato sauce. Fire roasted would be especially good. So chili powder, cumin, coriander, some sort of sausage and the meat, boom. You have crazy chili. Like that's an easy one. 
All you gotta do is braise the meat low and slow. Low and slow means on the stove top or in the oven, as low as it goes. The oven like 300, the stove top covered over a gentle simmer until it's falling apart. Depending on how big the ribs are, it'll take you two to three hours. Okay, next one. Um, this oh, this is, is fun. From S-P-E-R-P-I-S. How do I get past my fear of making carbonara? I'm afraid to temper the eggs. Um, what are you afraid of? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't have this person no, here. No, no, I just mean to that person. <laughs> what are you afraid of? First of all, right now, unless you're filming yourself like my husband's filming me, nobody's gonna see you. What a good time to try carbonara. Uh, honestly, there is no fear of it. It it really is super easy once you get the hang of it. And the only way you get the hang of it is to do it. If you're lucky enough to get eggs, which by the way, it is a hard commodity. We got the last two dozen last week. I have a great tip about grocery shopping, but we're gonna do all of our tips for, remind me, for grocery shopping at the end. But if you are lucky enough to have fresh eggs, Separate your eggs and your yolks, okay? We always crack our eggs on the counter, not into the bowl. Why? Cross-contamination issues and shell issues, okay? And if you're doing, oh my God, I just touched my face. Don't touch your face. Don't do that. Um, I'm going to wash up just for habit's sake. So if you are going to cook eggs, you crack them on the counter first. And when you separate them, you can save the whites in a baggie. Put a baggie inside a bowl, crack the egg and put the white into the baggie and you can whip them up into egg white omelets. You can even cook them in muffin tins or teeny tiny pans and turn them into egg white frittatas. They charge a lot for that at the Starbucks, by the way. You can just make it yourself. Um, and the yolks, uh, John's kind of crazy. Like I use up to six yolks per pound of pasta. You're probably good with three, but we use a lot of yolk for his carbonara. It goes, the ante goes up because he always wants it richer and eggier. So the ante's gone up a lot over the years. Our vegetables are sweat guys. So come over here because now we're going to do something. So this is about six tablespoons of butter and just salt right now. We haven't added pepper of any kind, okay? So to this, we're gonna sprinkle in the flour, AP flour, all purpose. Or if you're gluten-free, you would use potato starch, but you need less, remember, you need much less. Okay, so now we're gonna stir that so it doesn't taste like wallpaper paste. Remind me where we were when we go back. We're talking about eggs. Oh, the carbonara, yeah. All right, I'll be back to carbonara in a second. Okay, so once we can't see any flour anymore, let's get as much down in the pan as we can. So once we get that dissolved, this isn't the way you make roux, by the way. You bubble the flour, then you, uh, you bubble the butter, then you add the flour, then you wait for it to bubble again. But in this case, we're coating vegetables with the flour. We just want it to taste cooked, so we're good. Now we're gonna add a little acidity, half a cup of Sancerre, not oaky white wine, or a splash of vinegar or a splash of stock. All of that would be fine, okay? So now we're just giving that a place to cook out, okay? And we're gonna let that absorb. We're gonna let the little bit of acidity absorb over moderate heat, I'm about a little above medium. Okay, back up for carbonara. So back to what I was saying about carbonara. So the egg yolks are in a bowl, right? You can add the cheese, pecorino and parm is what we use both. Traditional is pecorino. We use a mix. You add a copious amount of cheese to the bowl. While you're whisking, right before the pasta is done, take a huge coffee cup, your coffee cup from the morning or a measuring cup, whatever. And while you're whisking, just dump the water in. That's tempering the egg, it's no big deal. When the pasta's done, dump it back in, in the pan that you're cooking 
the pancetta, AKA bacon of any kind, and your garlic in our case, not necessary, but we do, and your black pepper and your olive oil. You dump the pasta into the pan with the oil, okay? Then you toss the pasta around in the oil, take it off the heat. Now you're totally safe. Then add your carbonara mixture and toss, 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 toss that cheese and egg yolk mixture until it gets thick and glossy and coats the pasta. I guarantee you it's gonna be fine, but the only way to do it is to try, right? And what better time to try? Do it now, you're home. All you're doing is breaking eggs and spending a few noodles. It's a, it's a low cost risk. Okay, let me ask some personal questions as opposed to ingredient Oh, cheers, cheers. cheers. I don't even have a drink in my hand. Oh, that's your problem, not mine. Um, if you could only eat one food every day for the rest of your life. I wouldn't. Okay, that was an easy answer. Well, I, that's a snarky answer, but it's true. I wouldn't want to pick one of anything. Getting our stock, guys. Oh. Once we cook in our acid, we have to add our stock and let it thicken. And we're gonna have way more, this is really poaching liquid that we doctored, quite frankly, with some demi-glace, but we're gonna have way more than we need. So we can freeze this separately and use it for a bunch of different recipes, which is another bonus of making your own stock or poaching your own uh, meats and seafood, is that you have the byproduct of that. Okay, so let me ask you the next question, because I, I think I know the answer. This is from Kimber816. Who is your favorite fictional TV character? Columbo. I knew, of course. <laughs> Peter Falk, Columbo. I have watched um, Mysteries and Murder since childhood, and I like them as much, if not more, although I, I really do adore Bugs Bunny but I liked them even more than cartoons when I was a little girl. I love murder mysteries. And there used to be a thing called the Saturday Night um, Mystery Theater. And it was Columbo, McLeod, and McMillan and wife. And my favorite was Columbo. And my friend Joe Simon and, and my husband, actually several people have given me a lot of Columbo memorabilia, but I have two full box sets of every Columbo that was ever made and I fall asleep every single night watching them. And, the and that is no joke. And the Clousers, and the Clousers gave, gave, gave a me signed... a signed portrait of Peter Falk in his Columbo raincoat that hangs next to my air hockey table in my cellar. Thank you very much, Dave Jen. Okay, let's do one more question and then I'm gonna take a scotch break and then we'll come back. <laughs> um, Whoa, oh, that's not a question. This one, I, I know I know the answer to this Whoa, one, too. Whoa, it's not a question, John. This is from <laughs> at whitener.heather. What was the very first dish you ever made? Oh, I talked about it already. When I made dinner for my mom all by myself, the lasagna roll-ups with the spinach and the gorgonzola that I paired with mimosa, the first dish I ever made for John was? Uh, carbonara, of course. No. That's the first dish oh, you oh, asked for. for. What did we make dish. together? We made the... He's uh, wrong. An, uh, oh, no, I know what it was. It was the brown butter... Brown uh, butter ravioli, ravioli with aged balsamic chicken, vinegar. And the chicken with the lemon... Uh, and roast chicken with lemon. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. That's when we... There you go. First met. Good answer, by the way. Okay. You screwed that up a bit, but... John's taking a scotch break. Back soon. Pastry into the oven. Is the oven door open? Because I don't. No, no, it's not. So okay, I can't can't put it in there. Okay. Because I'm holding the camera with the other hand. I'm coming and I knocked out whatever that thing is you put into the wall in the kitchen. 
There you go. Oh. That's so gonna burn. We're gonna totally forget about it. Okay, here we go. Wait. Timers. Setting timer. I'm closing outdoor door. Okay, I broke this thing, whatever this was. Oh, you ruined my. Lighting. Our house is very dark. Hello. Our house is very dark. So John has this extra light that a friend gave him. It's not even our light. Whatever. He's trying to turn the light back in. If you can't see me, I'm still here. Hello. So all we did was add our fortified stock to the vegetables. It's starting to thicken up because we added the flour and John got scotch. There's the scotch. Thank God I don't drink that. scotch, so whatever. So see, we have all this leftover liquid. This will go into the freezer for extra meals in a flat uh, storage bag. And now we're gonna add our chicken. Oh, but wait, this is chicken pot pie, but it's also spring. Don't we want to add some spring vegetable perhaps? Hey, why not? Hey, why not? Well, why not? Because we're all trapped inside and who can go to the market and find spring vegetables? Here's some tips. Every week, only once a week, our local grocery store gets delivery. So I would say make friends with your grocery store manager, large or small. What days of the week are you getting produce? Everything else I order online. We'll talk about that in a minute. Produce, you, you, you've got to go wherever you can go to find it, okay? Oh my God, I touched my nose again. All right, washing. That's what we have to do. Stay home, wash your hands. I know, but even though I'm here, it's just a habit to be in, okay? Habit to be in, habit to be in. I got another cool question, maybe. Wait, no, let me finish my thought. Okay. Okay, so every time you find gold or a way better color green, Ooh. green is better than gold. Green is better than gold. Green is way better than gold. Every time you find green, okay, bring it home and blanch it. What is blanching? Boiling water, 30 seconds to a minute. I do two and a half minutes for like broccoli, Rob, because it's super bitter. But basically everything, 30 seconds to a minute, okay? Boiling water. Then I put it in an ice bath and then I put it on a little sheet tray and I put a little parchment and then I put peas or asparagus on them, on parchment. And why do we do this? You keep their integrity perfect. They're only brighter green. And when you freeze them on a sheet tray, you can pull them out in pieces rather than a gloppy blob where they're all frozen together. I can pull these out frozen. I defrosted these for you guys, but I could pull these out one at a time if I wanted to and just take three pieces of asparagus out because when you freeze your own on sheet trays, every single unit stays totally loose. You see this? Hashtag no gloppy blob. Bob, no, there's blob. no excess liquid blob. and there is absolutely no freezer burn. That's why these are fresh peas that I did myself 20 seconds. These guys are about 30 seconds and they're all individual. So now this will rotate from working tonight in this dish I will do sauteed carrots, asparagus, and peas tomorrow. The vegetable is going to be the rest of these vegetables that I defrosted today that I froze 10 days ago. And it keeps them loosey-goosey and you can stay seasonal. Okay, so here's our double batch chicken going in with our pre-cooked, or blanched I should say, with our asparagus and peas. And 
John put our puff pastry in the oven. Okay, so now we're gonna take our bench scrape and collect our asparagus. The things that need the least amount of time to just heat up, we add at the very last minute. There we go. Boop. Did you just boop? I did, I booped, I booped. Um. Whoops, I also spilled on the stove. <clears throat> oh, wow. <clears throat> so here's a question from at Mrs. Underscore Sarah Marie. Hi, Fa Sarah Marie. Favorite thing about quarantine? I, I am near my mom who is 85 and my dog who's 15, so about 112 in human years. <laughs> and she's going through a lot of health challenges and I am literally here around the clock every minute of the day to provide for my family. Um, I also have the time to think about all the things that I write down every year on a piece of um, notebook paper that I want to do more of or better. Playing the drums, learning how to paint properly, because I really just doodle. Um, learning how to speak any of the three languages that I speak half of. <laughs> um, learning a better command of English, reading more. Um, classics, not just popular items. Reminding myself of the rules and of the freedoms of just being alive. I think that every single day, whether you're in quarantine or just going to work, there's always the challenge, isn't there, of trying to find yourself. Oh, shoot, I didn't press record. Can we do that again? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm um, getting too serious. I wanted this to be fun for everyone. Should we check I wanted the, to do oven, more than one of these. The oven. The, no, I burn everything in the, the oven. oven. As anybody burning. watches my show knows that. That's your job. Okay, I'm gonna- You go look. I'm run over to the oven. Is this book okay? Yeah. Oh, this is, this is so done. No, you don't know if it's done. Did you touch it? It looks done to me. You have to touch it. If they're firm, they're done. I know this doesn't look like chicken pot pie. I'll get to it in a minute. So here's our double batch. So we're only gonna serve like literally at most half of this. Then we're going to flash freeze the rest of it, okay? Double batching everything makes so much sense. But this is now done for everybody to enjoy. Now we're gonna do the flourishes. These are, if you have, you can do, okay? I have some fresh herbs here. I have tarragon, chives, and dill, okay? Thanks to my friend, Lior at La Boite, he is the person I buy my spices from. I also have dried of all of these things. So if I didn't have fresh, I could add a sprinkle of anything dried. We're gonna add a little squirt of mustard. If you don't like mustard, you don't need it. We're gonna add a little squirt of lemon for brightness. We're gonna add a little bit of nutmeg, okay? And then just to go nuts, because I have some in the fridge, I'm gonna add some creme fraiche. You can also add sour cream or cream or nothing. This is delicious as is. See, this is great. This is your soup. Look how thick and beautiful. It's lovely. You can eat this plain, okay? We're gonna take this to a different place. That's all. <clears throat> Not a better place, just a different place. Keep asking some stuff. Okay. Um, this is from at Bin Dai and Bambi. 
Oh my God, I'm so sorry whatever my husband's saying about you. What's your all-time favorite spice you love to add to dishes? I think an underappreciated combo is caraway and cumin. They complement each other beautifully and they go into anything that's- um, oh, What's up, just rain. European to just sauerkraut on your Rubens or your Rachel's, or Rachel's a turkey Reuben. Has nothing to do with me, by the way. <laughs> oh, this is one of my favorite questions. This is from Zoe, Z-O-O-E-Y. Or Zoe. 395. Probably Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Sorry he's butchering your name. Can John post more music? Uh, you would have to ask John. Yes, I, I will. John, post. are you going to post more music? I will be posting more music. Speeding. Okay, so Isabu had her potty break. This is Dijon mustard. The fresh herbs, or you can use dried, creme fraiche, or you could use heavy cream. And these are just gilding the lily. Okay? This is not necessary. It's just what we do. And that goes in. And then we have that. And now we put in our pepper. The reason I didn't season with pepper yet is because I like white pepper in this dish or very finely ground black. Again, this is from my friend Lior at La Boite. It's very important to know when you're shopping some fun rules while this is heating through, okay? So number one, I'm adding a little nutmeg because there's cream in that now and a hint more of acidity with lemon juice, okay? So let's go over some shopping stuff. When I buy spices and special ingredients, I use online purveyors, uh, Calustians in <coughs> New York City, uh, and La Boite, the bottle, the spice bottle. And I also order fish now from Fulton Fish Market because Lobster Place is temporarily closed. So I try and order all of my proteins online. Dixon's is my butcher, but there's a bunch of them. Like there's a million. I'm just trying to limit what I have to actually get at the market and educate myself as to when that is delivered. Whatever day the fresh food is delivered to your market, there's no math, you know, or science to it, but I go the next day at an odd hour. Uh, I know all of this sounds like superfluous information if you're literally locked in your apartment. But if you're asking people to shop for you, that is a good tip. Be friends with the purveyors that are still also risking their lives to stock shelves and to be there for people. I know it's a weird time to say, talk to strangers, but I do think the more we can communicate without handshaking and just talking to each other, maybe the better it is. Wait, here's a question that might be relevant. It's from Marie Ma. Oh, I did it again, it touched my face. I get nervous, I touch my face. Okay, Marie. Marie Mal, 10, I'm listening. 1015. How long can I keep ground chicken frozen before it isn't good to eat? It depends on how much air you allowed in the bag. <clears throat> One of the best gifts I was ever given was from my friend Michelle, and it's a food saver bag. The more air you can take away from a product you're putting in the freezer, the longer it will last, up to a year, 12 months. I don't keep anything after six months and I don't keep anything once it gets freezer burn. Once it gets huge ice crystals all over it and it changes color in any way or form, it's gone. It's south, it's bye-bye. You have to let it go. I'm gonna ask a curveball question. This is from- Curveball. Rogue, at Rogue Taco 01. If, uh -huh. you, if you were a pinata, what shape would you be? Donkey! And, you don't even have to finish it. And what would you be filled with? Uh, donkey for sure. My mom's name is Scuderi. My full name is Raquel Domenica Scuderi Ray. A Scuderi is a, a Scuderia 
is a very specific type of donkey cart with the history of Sicily painted on the sides. My mom's family um, comes from Gela, Sicily, G-E-L-A, Gela. It is near Agrigento. It is a very, very poor town. Uh, her cousins still live in the apartment that my grandfather was born in. He was one of 14 children, the four youngest came here. And I collect donkeys as much as owls. When I was a little girl, they called me Little Hoot because I would never sleep at night. I was like an owl. Uh, but I also love donkeys because it's my birthright, my family name. I am a workhorse, AKA a donkey. And um, I have a true affection for donkey carts. Uh, so first part of the question, donkey was the second part? Wait, what would the pinata be filled with? If it were sweets, they would be Venki, V-E-N-C-H-I. Venki, the oldest chocolatier in all of Italy, based in Venice, and my love to my Italian cousins and distant cousins. So if I were going to be filled with candy, it would be Venki from Italy. Okay, where are you going now? Dog, I put the pastry back in the oven to keep it warm. Ah. So now I'm going to show people why we cut this into weird pieces. So I'm making mommy's. This is my mom's. The reason we cut them into weird shapes is because I don't make pot pies. The bottom pastry gets too doughy and icky and it doesn't taste good. It never gets crisp. So I take the bowl and I put it upside down on the pastry and I cut around it so that when it comes out of the oven, I have a topper. Look at that. Look at that. This is John's. What's with the, uh, the long looking things here? I'm gonna show you. Okay. This is John's because I always make extra I like to also just do sticks because you can make them into lattice and keep them in some foil overnight and have them the next day. And you can do this funny little thing with them and make it into a little lattice. And then the next day you can just reheat them in the oven. So there's lattice pot pie and chicken pot pie. 